happy that you're here to worship with us. So we are going to begin our service with a confession and assurance of forgiveness found on page 94 in your red hymnal. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and for whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are added to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you
please join with me the prayer of the day printed in your bulletin. O oh God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God. First reading of the day is come from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. The covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in, within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to, one, say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. The Lord, for I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. Here ends the first reading. The psalm is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. And please read the bold print. I treasure your promise in my heart. How shall the young keep their way clean by keeping to your word? I treasure your promise in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, instruct me in your statutes. With my lips I recite all the judgments of your mouth. I will meditate on your commandments and give attention to your ways. My delight is in your statutes. second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says, also in another place, you are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the second reading. The Gospel today is according to John in the 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son 
Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a, just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Our next hymn is number 330. See that in earth is dying. Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. May his true message come through my words as we learn together at this time. In every age, men and women have stood at the foot of the cross, attempting to understand the meaning of what had happened there, and why anyone would ever volunteer for such a horrible death. One leading New Testament scholar recently wrote an article saying that there are at least 
14 different theological perspectives of the cross presented in the scripture. It would seem that the cross is so vast in its meaning and extraordinary in its calling that one perspective cannot simply capture its meaning. However, there is at least one consistency. Whoever you are, whatever you believe, the cross is impossible to ignore. In this week's lectionary text, we find Jesus explaining to the disciples the cross that awaits him and why he must go. He, after all, had his own way of doing things. Jesus put the truth very strongly at times. And in this week's reading, he stated that those who love their lives will lose them. But those who hate their lives in this world will save them and keep them to, unto eternal life. To kind of get your attention. This certainly is a belief that we do not see very often in our modern world. How many people do you know that live this out? I would imagine this perspective was as different in Jesus' time as it would be in our own. Why is it that Jesus' perspective is so different than ours? We all see the world so differently. When walking in the forest, a lumberjack sees trees that are ripe for harvesting. The carpenter sees different kinds of woods for different kinds of furniture built. The hunter sees the place where animals might hide when the season is open. And the farmer sees fertile land that could benefit from clearing. We all have our own unique perspective in which we see the world. And Jesus had a unique perspective on the world that none of us could ever hope to have. Jesus was the Son of God. And in his perspective, Jesus saw and lived out the kingdom of God in everything he said and did. And he followed the vi this vision to the cross that awaited him. He not only followed it out of a sense of destiny, but he followed it out of love and a conviction that he was doing God's will. How many of us would follow him there? How many of us would follow Jesus all the way to the cross? Jesus came among us to rescue and reclaim lost souls, to set us free from the power of sin and death by returning to us God's love, God's law, and God's power. Who here would follow him? Who would be willing to leave everything that they have to give their own life that others would know God? Carl Jung, a God-fearing psychologist, offered another insight into this human tendency. As the world around us gets more prosperous, reducing real suffering, paradoxically, we naturally seek ways to replace real suffering with psychological suffering. But in this evolutionary process, we become more acutely aware and conscious of our suffering and the suffering of others. In English, we strive to hold on to what makes us human, both suffering and happiness. And we do, as we do so, we become more aware of both as our world becomes more prosperous. In other words, the more excess we have, the softer we become. The softer we become, the more sensitive we become to pain. Talk about putting money where your faith is. How does one walk away from money and power? It is so alluring and promising of a better life. So what does the gospel reading this morning offer to us? What can we take from this morning to enrich our lives and to make them more meaningful and fulfilled? Perhaps more than anything, a new perspective. Like the lumberjack, the carpenter,
hunter and farmer. We have a limited perspective on the forest in which we live. How about this morning? We look at the world through Christ's eyes and his journey to the cross. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains but a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life in this world will lose it. But the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is part of the law of God, given in the New Covenant, the law that God has written upon our hearts, which was fruitful in us and can bring meaning to our lives if we allow ourselves to hear it and to heed it. No, it's not the way this world thinks. It certainly is not the message of prosperity or instant success we see advertised day after day in the media. However, it is the way that God has wired each and every one of us. It is the law of God written upon our hearts. It's just the way we are wired. And Jesus knew this inner law of God, this law that states that the more we seek for ourselves, the more attached we become to the life we have. The more we seek to avoid pain and suffering, the more we ignore the needs of others and seek instead to meet our own needs. The more wretched we become, the closer to death we are. The tighter you try and hang on to your life and control every possible living within it, the more you will spin out of control. And I think most of us would agree with that. We at least get it at some sort of conscious level. We know what is right, but we sometimes slow to act upon it because we begin to question ourselves and how deep our convictions really lie when they bring about our own discomfort and pain. And then we feel guilty or perhaps even convicted by the Holy Spirit that our life is not in accord with God or his will for us. If we look back at the text, there is something else here that brings great comfort when I think about it. When I think about the many ways I fumble in the darkness and struggle through my everyday life, I wonder why my life does not always represent the ideals that I hold for myself. I comfort that Jesus struggles with this too. Even Jesus second guessed himself from time to time. If you look at verse 27, now my soul is troubled, he says. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Yet that is what he asks for when you look at Luke chapter 22, verses 42. Father, if you are willing to take this cup away from me. Jesus was no fool. Jesus did not want the pain of the cross. He did not want his death. He prayed to God that the cup would be passed by him. So what makes him different? If Jesus questioned himself also, how is he to lead us? Well, he stayed focused on the part that really mattered. And above all else, he trusted. He trusted that God's purpose for him, as dismal as it seemed at the moment, was truly for the best. If you continue in Luke, Jesus prays, Not yet my will be done, but yours. People of God, we are going to struggle for purpose. We are going to doubt ourselves. We are going to continue to fumble in the darkness. But in this stumbling and fumbling, if we see God and are willing to journey to the cross, we can find fulfillment in our lives. In many ways, we are like the people in the story. We have come here wishing to see Jesus. We have heard about Jesus and want to be his servants as we have come to learn that this is in our best interest. So we have come to learn about him so we can serve him 
and tell others about him. But as his servants, we are supposed to go where he goes. Although it's easy to follow Jesus when he is raising people from the dead, it's a lot harder to follow him when he is headed for the cross. There is nothing happy here. It's not a good time. Yet it was where God directed him to go and where his life's purpose was fulfilled. People of God, if we wish to follow Jesus there, there are crosses in our future. If we seek to be disciples of Jesus, then there will be some dark times ahead, just as there were dark times for Jesus' first disciples. But we know we'll never be alone. Jesus offers us the hope in the times of darkness. The light is with us now, and Christ is here. If we trust, if we trust in the light, we will become sons and daughters of the light. Then, when the darkness comes, we will not be left fumbling in the dark. I am sure you've all heard the expression, let go and let God. In fact, you've probably heard it enough that it's somewhat of a cliché. But people of God take this seriously this morning. You can find fulfillment if you are truly willing to let go and to trust. If you desire meaning and purpose for your life, seek God's face first. Be prepared to find that God's desire for your life will be different and in the end, far better than your own. This is just the way we are wired. It is the way that God has designed and engineered us to run. God has written his law upon our hearts. Serving God as the others is the only way to truly fulfill and to fulfillment and purpose. Thomas Merton wrote the following prayer. See that these words are that God has written upon your heart. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself and the fact that I am thinking I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire for all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the road, right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always through, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Stand as you are able from the Apostles' Creed. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, my Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body for the life of everlasting. God of mercy and grace, we thank you that you are with us today, and we are here with the knowledge and the trust that you are always with us, regardless if we're in the darkness or in the light. God, in your mercy, Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share that piece. <laughs>
there and ask for it. Send it for you.
back and just kind of do that. <laughs> so never look at me. I'm just dancing back here. <laughs> Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, saying to his disciples, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank you. 
announcements. Who would like to start? Reminder for those who are in the reading of the cry of the congregation, grab yourself some coffee, grab yourself something to snack on, and we will going to begin practice shortly thereafter. Next week is going to be a very different service than our traditional Sunday morning service. You need to be prepared for what we are going to do here, and you may want to bring some Kleenex or anything like me. Well, that extra around too. So. <laughs> You're going to turn 11? When? <laughs> Tomorrow. Fabulous. Anybody else have any birthdays coming up? Oh, that's not even the right basket. That's a clean basket. <laughs> consider hosting, prepping, cooking, or cleaning up uh, for our fellowship hour following services. Second, oh, one more thing. Even if you've never been in a position of having to fire someone, think about how gratifying it might feel to hand a pink slip to us. <laughs> okay. Second is, uh, some of you have probably heard that the audit committee is formed and is working. So I want to let everyone know who is on that committee, which is a standing committee of the congregation uh, required by our constitution. The audit committee uh, kind of by statute, we heard a lot of statutes in our reading today, are myself, Jeannie Crocker, who was here earlier, and Brad Olson. So we are the three people. I'd like to tell you it's been a number of years since the congregation has had an audit, but it's something that's a good thing for us to do. So I do want to tell you that the audit that we're talking about is not a witch hunt. Oh, Dan's disappointed. <laughs> we're, we're going to just make sure everything is uh, done properly. And if we can identify some deficiencies, we will make those recommendations to the council. And we hope to have our work done in the next couple months so that we can have our, quote, management report to the council prior to the mid-year meeting, 
which will be coming up tail end of May or June. So if anyone has any questions about the audit or input to the audit, the three people you need to talk to are those on the committee. Anything else? Okay, and I also want to formally thank Jeannie and Brad for working with me on this. Audits are not very sexy and they're not a ton of fun, but we're trying to make them fun. Thank you. There are several announcements in your bulletin. I encourage you to read those. Um, this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday is our last Lenten soup and bread in service. After that, it will be Holy Week. We won't be meeting on Wednesday, but we will be here Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. The week after that at 5 o'clock. We have St. Crummy's Day coming up March 3rd. We need help for cleaning. If you don't clean, I'm gonna hand you a pink slip. <laughs> You'll have to do one or the other, choose. <laughs> Just helping out is a huge task here at the church. We have a lot to do to make our church beautiful, more than it already is. So please consider helping us with that. There's small jobs, large jobs, Fun jobs, creative jobs, I don't know what all. Um, and then I'll be starting a new member class after Easter. So it's going to be an evening class. It is for everybody, even if you're already a member. It's going to have some good understanding of what it means to be a Lutheran and what it means to be a member in this church and how we can live our lives with those. Any other announcements? All right. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with grace and mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Our sending him is Lift High the Cross, number 660.
Let your light shine in love and service. Thanks be to God.